almost there. Keep fighting. Get ready to move out. Roger, inbound and hot. You are clear to engage all enemy personnel. Copy. Maybe you were taught to believe in Jesus at one point, but all that religious stuff never felt like it was for you. Maybe you've been a firm believer and a faithful churchgoer for most of your life, or it could be that you've only recently been introduced to the Bible with the understanding that it is the inspired word of God. Regardless of where you are in your faith, most people can acknowledge that there is a battle between good and evil in this world. The majority of rational thinkers recognize that there are indeed truths, and then there are lies working against those truths. Anyone who isn't entirely desensitized by philosophy can admit that there does ultimately exist absolutes of right and wrong, justice and injustice, that there is righteousness and in contrast, wickedness, or what some may even call sin. The average study in recent times concludes that well over half the world's population believes in a spirituality of some kind, and most of the world's belief sets attribute certain beings with holy or unholy characteristics. In fact, history is full of legends about gods and titans, angels and spirits, monsters and demons, constantly in conflict with each other and with mankind. But for those of us who have even a mustard seed of faith in the God who sent his son into the world, you are on the right side of the oldest and most significant war of all time. So what responsibilities do we have if his words are true? This world is a battlefield and every moment we're still breathing, we are fighting this fight. So what and who are we fighting against? Whose side are we on and what do they stand for? The warfare is ramping up exponentially, and it's time we figure out the answers to these questions. I'm Wes Blaze, and my life was radically changed by the transformational power of the Holy Spirit as a result of my faith in the God of the Bible and His Son. This is a new show called Fight the Good Fight, Fight, the good fight. and you're watching episode one, Call to Duty, Spiritual Warfare. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Before many witnesses. fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. What is spiritual warfare? Most pastors don't teach this. People just don't know. Guys, this spiritual battle is so real and I need y'all guys to wake up. Spiritual warfare is not being taught in the church. Nobody knows what spirits they're combating. Nobody knows how to go about combating them. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Basically, spiritual warfare is about one thing. It's about keeping people from God. The enemy doesn't want people saved. He doesn't want us to learn the truth of Christ. The enemy knows your weak spots. He wants you blinded in sin and unbelief and comfortable. Spiritual warfare is really the um, engagement with the spirit realm. The authority we've been given is so decimating to them. You have the authority to cast out evil spirits. That's why they go out screaming at times. They scream and screech going out at times because that authority is so overwhelming. Stay obedient and do not open demonic doorways. If you stay in sin and keep opening up doors to demons, eventually something will get in. If you remain obedient to God and resist the devil, he will flee. The more you know about what you're dealing with, the more you will know how to fight against these evil forces. Demons have all the marks of personality. Everything that you would associate with a person, a demon hands. They are persons. Persons without body. The majority of Christians caught up in this warfare with demons 
do not realize that they are dealing with persons, active, intelligent beings who study you and know you and know your weak points and they act with intelligence. They have two main objectives assigned to them by Satan. The first one is to keep you from becoming a Christian, from knowing Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter what means they use as long as they achieve that objective. Their second main objective, if they fail in the first, is to keep you from being an effective Christian. They will now do everything they can to keep you from serving Jesus Christ effectively. They will plot and plan with supernatural intelligence to achieve this objective. And you are subject to their plotting and planning and attack. But you cannot escape. It's part of your environment as a Christian. In fact, it's part of the environment of the world. The world is people with unseen but very real agents who are called demons. If the devil is attacking you, fight back. Fight back. Fight of faith, fight the good fight of lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Before many witnesses. Before many witnesses. Throughout time, believers have answered the call to join the front lines in rallying against evil, exposing the works of darkness, and defending against the attacks of the enemy. And still today, I believe God is sounding the alarm in the hearts and minds of people everywhere, calling us to seek him out and engage in the good fight. But before we can jump right into hand-to-hand -hand combat on a battlefield with skilled, intelligent opponents, it's best to be properly equipped and trained. I have no doubt that the power of God can work through someone who has little to no knowledge on this subject whatsoever. But for those of you who want to understand more about becoming a stronger warrior in this spiritual war, this is the call to duty. If we lose this, we're done. Fight your last. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing whether it be good or whether it be evil or whether it be evil. This is the whole duty of man, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes. The whole duty of man. The English word duty is defined as a moral or legal obligation, a responsibility, a task or an action that someone is required to perform. So what is our moral and legal obligation that man is required to perform? Fear God and keep his commandments. So what does it mean to fear God? Here is the definition of the Hebrew word translated as fear in that passage. One aspect is that we stand in awe of him in reverence, honor, and respect. But this word also carries a connotation of being afraid, dreadful, astonished, and terrified. Some would reason that it's wrong to be fearful of someone you love in this way. But in the case of the Most High God, we should absolutely be thankful to him as our father and maker, and we should also tremble at the thought of his judgment. Much like if we grew up in our earthly father's household, then ideally we were close with him and loved him, but we were also scared of his punishment if we were to disobey the rules of his house. And if we loved him, then we would be afraid to hurt him because we know he loves us. Likewise, we should be afraid to hurt God. We should recognize that he is the almighty creator of heaven and earth and the ultimate judge, not an oppressive dictator, but a holy and all-powerful, loving father, completely just and righteous, perfect in all his ways, that he is worthy to be submitted to, to be submitted to, to be submitted to. So what is the fear of the Lord? You cannot have a proper view of the gospel without the fear of God. We have a whole generation totally devoid of the fear of God. There's very little of the fear of God among today's Christians. The fear of the Lord is one of the great needs in the church today, I believe. They know nothing of the fear of God. So many Christians have got the idea, well, that was something from the Old Testament. It was under the law. 
We don't need the fear of the Lord in our lives at all. That's old-fashioned. The, the theme of the fear of the Lord is through the whole Bible. Too many Christians are really not convinced of this matter of the fear of God. A whole lot of people are learning about grace who haven't learned about the fear of God. And you've got to learn the fear of God before you can appreciate the grace of God. Otherwise, you'll get a false grace. It's got to produce an inner knowing that God will not wink at sin. Why are they promiscuous? Why is there no peace? Why is there turmoil? There is no fear of God before their eyes. How then do I live if he is truly this holy and powerful God? Not just a monster tyrant. No, that's not who he is, but a holy and powerful God. The fear of the Lord doesn't just mean to have a healthy respect of God. When we fear God, we will do our best to honor him and obey his will. That if I disobey him, if I if I offend him, that there is this terror. It's a respect of God. I know what he can do, and I don't want his displeasure. I don't want to break his heart. It's got to produce a conviction that we're going to reap what we sow. How did the angel know that Abraham feared God? Because he obeyed instantly. Because he obeyed when it didn't make sense. Because he obeyed when it hurt. Because he obeyed when he didn't see a benefit. And because he obeyed to completion. A true fear of the Lord realizes you can't run from God, and the only option is to run to Him, and when you do, you find the embracing arms of a loving Father. A loving Father. A loving Father. For we know Him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge His people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The beginning of wisdom is, I do not know. Psalm 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. This tells us that if we have no fear of God, then we haven't even begun our journey into true godly wisdom. That same verse ends by saying, A good understanding have all those who do His commandments. His praise endures forever. So the wisdom and understanding of fearing God gives us the desire to obey the rules of His house. It causes us to want to do what is pleasing to Him, because we acknowledge that His way is right in a world full of wrong. Long before the psalmist penned that hymn, Job phrased it this way, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. Likewise, Proverbs echoed, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. So what do we even know if we don't put God first and obey His instruction? All too often, people describe their idea of God as a personal kind of butler, conforming to the imaginations of individuals and catering to their desires, with no mention of what it really means to serve God or be fearful of His judgments. In the same chapter of Proverbs, God goes on to say, Because I called and you refused, I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention and you neglected all my counsel and did not want my reproof. I will also laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would not accept my counsel, they spurned all my reproof, so they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But he who listens to me shall live securely and will be at ease from the dread of evil. These words are serious, brothers and sisters. As loving and compassionate, long-suffering and graceful as God is, he has a limit with people who reject what is good. He will enact justice on all those who choose wickedness and ignorance over His correction and fearing Him. If God is a just judge, then He absolutely has a system of judgment that will repay men for the wrongs they refuse to turn from. So, if you're beginning to understand that the fear of God is something you need to have as a believer, and you're wondering how do you attain that fear, there's no mystery here. Proverbs 2, 1 through 5. My son, if you will receive my words and treasure my commandments within you, make your ear attentive to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding. 
For if you cry for discernment, lift your voice for understanding. If you seek for her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then you will discern the fear of the Lord and discover the knowledge of God. Notice the if and then scenario. You will discern the fear of the Lord if you receive God's word, treasure his commandments, listen to wisdom, incline your heart to understanding, call to him with earnest sincerity for discernment and understanding, seek his wisdom, then you will discern or figure out the fear of the Lord. So do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. Because in the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence and his children will have refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life that one may avoid the snares of death. Fearing the Lord is what a strong and confident faith looks like, and we can rest assured the fear of the Lord leads to life so that one may sleep satisfied, untouched by evil. So if we truly reverence God's authority in our lives, then whose definition of good and evil do we adhere to? What standard of behavior and whose ways do we look to to determine right from wrong? Deuteronomy 6, 24 through 25 says, So the Lord commanded us to observe all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God for our good always and for our survival as it is today. It will be righteousness for us if we are careful to observe all this commandment before the Lord our God just as he commanded us. The word of God is everlasting from beginning to end, and he knew the end from the beginning when he laid out his instruction for righteous living and good behavior. This passage is often ignored when believers read the New Testament and see the word righteousness. While the synoptic gospels and epistles are teeming with mentions of righteousness and unrighteousness, it is rarely acknowledged that the definition for righteousness according to God is keeping his commandments. He decides the code of ethics and sets the bar for morality. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. Deuteronomy 8, 6 goes on to say, Therefore you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to fear him. 1 Samuel 12, 24, Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider, what great things he has done for you. The ancient Greek Septuagint version of the great scroll of Isaiah in chapter 66 verse 2 says, For all these things are mine, saith the Lord, and to whom will I have respect but to the humble and meek and the man that trembles at my words? So according to God's word, it is his own ways, which are his commandments, that we should look to for guidance and instruction, that we should only fear him with the humble attitude of a servant, and that we tremble at his word. This requires that we listen to his word. And some of these books we're going to be looking at used to be in our American canon up until the late 1800s when they were removed without my permission or any believer's permission. The book of Ecclesiasticus, also known as the book of Sirach, included in the 1611 KJV, the Septuagint and many other versions is like the book of Proverbs, but even more in depth and is exactly the kind of book those who are pursuing the path of righteousness can glean from. In the original 1611 King James and many other versions of Christian Bibles across the world, there exists a text called the Book of Sirach. It's also commonly called Ben Sirach or Ecclesiasticus, not to be confused with Ecclesiastes. Although this book was removed from most modern Western Bibles, it contains a treasure of further information about what it means to fear God. Chapter 1 verses 11 through 13 say, The fear of the Lord is honor and glory and gladness and a crown of rejoicing. The fear of the Lord makes a merry heart and gives joy and gladness and a long life. Whoever fears the Lord, it will go well with him at the last, and he will find favor in the day of his death. According to verse 21, it is the fear of the Lord that drives away sins. And what does God's word define as sin? 1 John 3, 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Sin is the transgression of the law. Ecclesiasticus 2, 15 through 18 expounds, They that fear the Lord will not disobey his word, and they that love him will keep his ways. They that fear the Lord will seek that which is well-pleasing to him. 
and they that love him will be filled with the law. They that fear the Lord will prepare their hearts and humble their souls in his sight, saying, We will fall into the hands of the Lord and not into the hands of men, for as his majesty is, so is his mercy. And in case it wasn't clear enough, Ecclesiasticus 10.19 continues, They that fear the Lord are a sure seed, and they that love him an honorable plant. They that regard not the law are a dishonorable seed. They that transgress the commandments are a deceivable seed. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Ecclesiasticus 15.1 Whoever fears the Lord will do good. Whoever is practiced in the law will come to wisdom. Therefore, if you're looking for genuine godly wisdom, practice keeping the laws and commandments of God. Ecclesiasticus 1.26 If you desire wisdom, keep the commandments, and the Lord will give her to you. Ecclesiasticus 19.18-20 says, the fear of the Lord is the first step to be accepted of him, and wisdom obtains his love. The knowledge of the Lord's commandments is life-giving discipline, and those who do what is pleasing to him enjoy the fruit of the tree of immortality. Fearing the Lord is the whole of wisdom, and all wisdom involves doing the law. Ecclesiasticus 23.27 proclaims that there is nothing better than the fear of the Lord, and that there is nothing sweeter than to take heed to the commandments of the Lord. If you're not convinced that this consistent message is for you as a New Testament believing Christian, consider then the words of our Messiah. Matthew 10.28 Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in Gehenna. The Apostle Paul has this to say in Acts 13, 26. Brethren, sons of Abraham's family, and those among you who fear God, to us the message of this salvation has been sent. Again in Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit perfecting holiness in the fear of God. An alarming amount of believers in this faith from a growing number of denominations have been taught to accept that none of these verses I've presented are true for them anymore. And if the fear of the Lord is mentioned at all, the idea that it is synonymous with keeping God's laws was nailed to the cross, as they've been taught to say. As believers in Christ Jesus, Yeshua of Nazareth, our High Priest, Prophet, and Beloved Son of the Most High God, are we no longer to fear God in the same way He consistently described to the prophets before Him? Because our Messiah kept His Father's law perfectly, is it somehow demeaning or blasphemous for us to practice His same behavior and walk as He walked in our lives today? God forbid, my friends. God does not change. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the law of God is eternal. The law of God is eternal. Jesus abolished the Old Testament. Jesus abolished the Old, the Old Testament. Testament's law. been done away with. We don't have to with. obey the law anymore because Jesus fulfilled it. Jesus fulfilled it. Jesus fulfilled it. That's the old law. Jesus died, we aren't so we under don't the law, have to we're be under the, the new covenant. We don't follow those Old Testament laws. Didn't you read our God doctrine on the wall? God doesn't care if you follow the old laws. You are you trying to become a Jew? Are you trying, are you trying to become, trying a, become a, a Jew? We don't have to follow all of His commandments. Just the ten important ones. If you follow the law, you're cursed by the law. We but follow that's the, the law of Christ. Law. Jesus died, so we don't. I read have in the to Bible the well, we're not supposed to eat pork. That's Old Testament law. You don't have to follow that anymore. Why's that? God changed his mind. That's why he sent us Jesus. Aren't you glad God changed his mind and did away with the law? In the Old Testament, God wanted us to follow his rules. Now he just wants us to accept his grace. Amen? We're not justified by works. Are you trying to earn your salvation? Are you trying to earn Don't your salvation? All you need to do is follow All you need is grace. God doesn't care if you follow the Old Testament. Oh, you're not justified grace. by I works. I walk the aisle at my church, so I'm saved. I don't have to keep all those Old Testament laws and commandments because I know Jesus now. Because I know the Jesus law now. Nailed to the cross. Look, I know God. He knows me. He knows what's in my heart, and that's all that matters. Father, we ask that, that you be with our friends. Lord, we, we accept you for us. If, God, we, ask, God, we, we pray for your blessing. Father, we just ask that you be with us in everything we do. Dear God, 
Let this food go to nourishment. We, we pray that you lead us, that you lead us and, guide us. and guide us. The cellular customer you are trying to reach is unavailable. Please try your call again later. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. 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 And will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as a sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's up to us to determine what's right and wrong in our hearts. Let your heart lead you. Let your heart lead you. I listen to my Let heart, your heart and Jesus you. tells me what I don't to need do. to read the Old Testament. I trust my heart. Wherever it leads, I'll go. I do not I have to follow a set of rules to live me, by. And that's what I do. I trust my heart. I follow my heart and we I have a heart for Jesus. Jesus. Our hearts will tell us what's right. It's the intention of your heart It's the intention of your heart that matters. It's the intention of your heart that matters. Let Jesus come into your heart and you will be saved. Can't you feel Jesus tugging <laughs> on your heart? I don't have to worry. I have Jesus I go in my heart. Heart. All we need is a personal relationship with Jesus. We just need to know him and have faith in him. I have Jesus in my heart. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Therefore do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death, or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness resulting in sanctification. All your words are true. All your righteous laws are eternal. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous ordinances is everlasting. The entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. This call to duty is a calling to turn to God with all your heart, mind, and soul. This is a call to true repentance. Spiritual warfare is a war where the enemy is in rebellion against God and his righteousness, and that enemy fights to recruit whoever it can every day. But the opportunity for you to submit to God is present in every conscious moment of life. So if any of the concepts expressed in this episode are new to you or different than what you've been taught before, please know that I understand. The enemy has attacked every minutia of God's truth. Believers everywhere are being fed a lukewarm message of what it means to walk out this faith with a proper fear of God. The subject of whether or not Christians should practice the law of God is widely debated, and this brief presentation isn't even the tip of the iceberg for what it means to effectively engage in spiritual warfare. So I invite you to join me in the next installment of Fight the Good Fight. Biblical Boot Camp We're at spiritual war. Our priorities have to change. 
Right now, it's about advancing pure worship. There is a war going on for each and one of these souls. This generation is perishing. We live in dangerous times. We need God's power to survive and thrive spiritually in a godless world. Discover the proven strategy for winning your spiritual war. Most people probably don't really know what true spiritual warfare is. It is spiritual in nature. There is a spiritual war and battle going on for truth and righteousness. And when you have real faith, you have real power. You have to know the Bible. You have to know God. You're going to lose the war. And it's vital that we understand that the battle is real and that we have an enemy. What does the Bible teach about the nature of the spiritual battle in which we as Christians are engaged? And how do we fight it? We have all the truth that we need in the pages of Scripture to effectively live God-glorifying, victorious, and obedient Christian lives. And so I ask you, viewer, are you committed to rely on Scripture and Scripture alone for information regarding the spiritual realm and the nature of spiritual warfare?